Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francesca, for the introduction. And uh, thank you for everyone who's been part of uh, organizing this, uh, this get-together. I, I, I hope to present a few thoughts and then to open up for questions and discussion and conversation around um, this issue or other issues related to, uh, to women's health. Um, thank you to the translators. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you and I are stuck with listening to a very colonial <laughs> language that is not our favorite. Um, and I wish I could speak Catalan, <laughs> and I'm sorry that I cannot. Um, but do feel free to ask your questions in Spanish or Catalan, and hopefully I'll get most of it. And if not, then I'll direct the questions to Francesca. <laughs> um, thank you also to, um, uh, I don't know their names, but the people, the very uh, wonderful and uh, creative individuals who put together the, the poster for the activity. And uh, I've... Uh, copied a, a, a tiny part of it because I love the, uh, the image so much. So um, thank you to, to this uh, person and uh, sorry for stealing the, uh, the image for this PowerPoint presentation. I think it's lovely. So um, today what I'd like to talk about is uh, some are part of the research that I've done. Um, this is more pre-research, I would say, um, on the issue of women and um, obesity. And in the title, um, we mention dominant discourses around obesity and health. Um, and I've decided to use this strategy of calling these dominant discourses um, postcards. <laughs> and uh, I'll tell, talk a little bit about postcards um, and then about this obesity clinic and then I'll conclude. So why postcards? Here you have a postcard of Montreal and Francesca and uh, Maria Antonia, where are you? I don't have my glasses. <laughs> Uh, where there, and we met for a women's health conference <clears throat> last uh, fall. And uh, the postcard is a very simple and efficient picture. And that picture proposes to tell the truth about a particular place. And of course, if you're a Montreal lover, you think this picture is the truth. Um, but Montreal also has other sides that are not as beautiful. Um, so, the picture is, is a, a, a scenographic performance um, that hides those things we would rather not see. And so uh, in Cadaquez, where I've just been, we've seen many beautiful pictures, uh, although it was hard to find a, an ugly side to Cadaquez, I have to say, I loved <laughs> uh, everywhere I've been there. But uh, there are some... Uh, things that the postcard uh, hides. Uh, the postcard is a dry fragment of a very humid reality, if you wish. And the postcard circulates certain understandings and misunderstandings. And I find that uh, in the issue of obesity, that's a bit what, uh, what we have. And so what I'd like to do is share with you a, a small series of postcards related to obesity. And uh, these postcards uh, circulate a particular truth about obesity. And the hope is that this uh, truth upon repetition um, will become um, uh, something that everybody agrees with. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, postcards and repeating postcards also circulate misunderstandings. And uh, so uh, today I would like to speak about these postcards and what I call counter postcards or counter discourses. So the first postcard is uh, obesity uh, is a disease. And those who circulate 
the, am I going too fast for the translator? Is it? It's okay? Okay. Um, so those who circulate this postcard need to um, hide the history of the transformation of what we call in English fatness, and I don't know if there's a Catalan equivalent. Uh, so transforming fatness into obesity. Um, they need to veil the story of those who have uh, pushed very hard to construct obesity as a disease, um, as well as those who profit, obviously, from this, this labeling. And uh, you can think here of uh, bariatric surgeons, uh, certain people in health, uh, weight loss uh, industry, uh, drug makers, those who are into weight loss drugs, uh, insurance companies, uh, and even obesity scientists. By labeling obesity a disease, what we do is we transform fatness into something uh, very particular that allows, for instance, insurance companies to uh, open up insurance for millions of uh, individuals who now need quote-unquote treatment for their disease. So you can see how fatness is quite different from obesity. Uh, and one is just something that you are, it defines you, and the other one is a disease that requires treatment uh, and from which many uh, big pharmaceutical companies uh, can profit. Um, <clears throat> some of the problems with um, obesity then is the fact that it unnecessarily medicalizes the condition, and I'll come back to why I say unnecessarily. Um, it diverts scarce resources. Uh, it may not be the case yet in, um, here in Catalonia, but in North America, uh, there's hundreds of millions of dollars that are spent every year on initiatives to get rid of obesity, uh, and these resources would be better used for many other public health um, issues. Um, it also distracts public health uh, efforts, and uh, I contend that it also produces uh, obesity in the sense that uh, where we had before simply fatness, uh, we have discourses that are now productive. They, they construct something like a disease that is called obesity and that now requires that, uh, you know, resources be spent to get rid of this particular quote-unquote uh, disease. A second postcard is, um, has to do with the body mass index, and I'm not sure what the acronym here is. Uh, in English, we say BMI, body mass index. Um, and so there's this thinking that it is a good way of measuring obesity. And indeed, for 99% of the research being done um, in the Western world, uh, the BMI is used to uh, measure obesity. Uh, what is weird about this is the fact that, of course, the body mass index is a, a weight to height ratio. So if you look at your weight and your height, you can determine the BMI, but of course, weight and height don't have anything to do with fatness. So it's a m something, an index to measure fatness that does not take fatness into account. Um, I love to <laughs> yeah, I love to talk about this. Um, so, and the, so the man who invented this index is a, a Belgian mathematician who thought, who thought that uh, it should be used to describe the general population, but specifically said that it should not be used to measure fatness. But that's exactly what uh, we are doing at the moment. Um, so one of the problem uh, with measuring 
fatness with an index that does not take fatness into account is uh, the following aberration. So I give the example of me, Jen, um, and my cute little um, nephew, whose name is Vincent. And Vincent is a, is a national judo champion in Canada. Uh, he's about, uh, I think, 19 years old at the moment. And uh, uh, Vincent is my height, um, but he's a bit uh, more muscular, as you could imagine, <laughs> than I am. So in terms of his weight, is uh, much heavier because he's only muscle, and uh, I'm many other things than muscle. <laughs> and so uh, Vincent, for his uh, training, has to keep his uh, fat level very low, and it, currently his fat level is at 11%. So uh, he's just mean muscle mass, whereas I have 25% of fat. And so my BMI is at 24, which currently in Canada would be considered a healthy, uh, you know, BMI for a woman my age. Whereas Vincent, uh, at 27, is considered uh, obese. So you could see a little bit with this example how um, this measure of obesity doesn't work so well. Um, so the person with the less fat is also the one who's categorized as obese, whereas I'm, I'm sort of pre-obese at 24 uh, of a BMI, but I'm not obese yet. Um, the interesting thing is that this index, of course, has been challenged by many people around the world because currently it's still used to look at uh, fat levels, but uh, people of the, uh, in Asia, for instance, have said, this BMI doesn't work for us. Uh, you know, it, 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 it just doesn't make enough of us fat. And so we need to change it so that we have a better sense of how many fat people we have. Um, and so they've used now, uh, they've, they've introduced indexes, uh, and so that the, the index is different now in many countries. Uh, which, again, is, is sort of a, um, a clue, I guess, to the fact that, um, it, that the BMI is a constructed reality. If you can change it at will and make it different for different ages, for instance, you can't use the BMI for kids, and it's not very good either with very old women. Um, you know, so how much of an... Of, of a reality is it if it's constructed to mean many different things for many different people. <clears throat> a third postcard is that obesity is directly related to health problems. Um, I guess one first thing to say about this is the fact that um, every time people have looked at the real uh, fat content of individual. Uh, usually these have been with uh, suits called doxas or, or instruments called doxas um, or sometimes with fat calipers. Um, so there's more sophisticated ways of looking at the fat content. When we look at the real fat content, we can see um, some relationship between uh, levels of fat and uh, health, but when we use uh, the BMI, uh, all of the statistics um, are much better. In other words, the relationship between BMI and health is much stronger uh, than with the real um, fat level. So it, it's a first clue that there's a problem with, with using this index, or a second clue, I, I should say. Uh, but probably the more interesting things uh, for us in the social sciences is um, to figure out that when we look at the BMI and we try to see how predictive it is of health, it sort of works at first glance. And so there seems to be some relationship, a, a tiny one, but some. But the minute that you start to control for certain important variables, such as socioeconomic status, uh, physical activity or the quantity of physical activity people engage in or weight cycling or um, you know the use of uh, 
various psychotropic drugs, uh, which in North America, you know, alone would probably explain what they what they call the obesity epidemic, <clears throat> uh, because of course there's more water retention, and so you get much heavier with these drugs. Um, so when you look at these uh, variables, suddenly the relationship between uh, BMI and health is totally muddled. It doesn't work anymore. Um, and so at the same time, you can, why I t talk about postcard is that yes, uh, you know, this picture of a relationship between weight and health, there's a certain truth to it. But when you go in particular corners and you, uh, you know, you do a little bit of a better analysis and you control for some very important variables, suddenly the reality changes quite drastically. <clears throat> And so, uh, for instance, there's much talk about uh, a link between uh, the BMI and uh, illness, morbidity, and the same lines, I think, uh, appear when we talk about uh, the BMI and mortality. Uh, so the sort of postcard version of this graph shows a very direct relationship and a direct line, and so the more <coughs> you increase the BMI, uh, the more illness you have. And in the case of mortality, the more mortality you have. And usually to get at this, they select two points. And they draw a line between these two points. Again, it's a postcard. It tells us a tiny little truth. Uh, when you uh, do the complete analysis, uh, this graph comes from the more recent uh, studies in the U.S. with 150,000 subjects, so it's a huge uh, health survey, um, and uh, it was uh, finalized in 2011. And so you have, a, you have the same, you could probably, you know, use this and this and draw your line, <clears throat> but if you want to do the better work, um, then you look at all of the points, and then you see, first of all, the very uh, important and nasty effect of anorexia, which you don't see with the other graph. And so with very low BMI, extremely low BMI, uh, very high uh, morbidity, you have to know in Canada, for instance, uh, for young women um, <clears throat> who uh, uh, from the onset of anorexia, I've had uh, anorexia for 20 years. Um, uh, there's 20% mortality rate. And so anorexia is a killer. I mean, it's, it's a huge statistic, whereas you don't hear very often people dying because they're big. Uh, it may happen if you're 3,000 pounds, uh, but you know, apart from these extreme cases, you don't see a whole lot of that. Um, so, but that's for mortality. For morbidity, so the picture is more complete, and what we see is the effect <coughs> of uh, an, a high BMI on uh, morbidity, particularly in the very high portions. So here. Okay. But if you look at this, uh, you know, it sort of contradicts the dominant discourse that would say that, uh, you know, with uh, higher uh, BMIs, you would have more uh, morbidity. And in fact, it is exactly the contrary. This seems to be a protective element, uh, which means that uh, morbidity continues to decrease with the increasing um, BMI. So it's a very different picture. Uh, in terms of health outcomes, in, in any case, to sort of sum up this situation, um, what we find is that in all cases, uh, for all the studies that have been done where... Ah, okay. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, so <clears throat> with... Um, 
all the studies that have been done so far, including uh, issues of or links between BMI and health, uh, at the most we found a, a correlation of 0.3, or since correlations are squared, that's about 9%. Uh, variants that we can explain, which means that 91% of health outcomes uh, currently we are not explained or are not related uh, to BMI. So um, that gives us uh, a different picture in terms of the link between health and obesity. The other thing is that the statistics that are currently existing are always between um, people who've always been fat, and they compare them with people who've always been thin. Uh, and so it, it gives us a different kind of picture in the sense that we don't have statistics where we try to see, well, okay, if we have um, always fatter people, uh, but we would compare them to people who's, uh, who's, who have reduced their fat level, uh, what would happen? In other words, does the fact that you're reducing your fat, is that increasing your health? Well, we don't know. I mean, we, we do know that there's not a whole lot of a relationship, but when we're trying to compare <coughs> these two groups, what happens is that uh, we, we are lacking of these kinds of people. Uh, why? Because... <laughs> because we haven't found a way to have reduced fat people. I mean, you have people who are losing weight, but most of the time they put it back on. Uh, and currently, at the best, we can find maybe four or 5% of people who've followed some sort of a diet, who've kept the, who've maintained the weight loss. Usually the weight loss is not maintained. And so we don't find enough of these people to really make the comparison. So the 9% uh, percent, uh, of health outcomes explained by the BMI is a bit overinflated because of that phenomenon. Uh, a fourth postcard is that uh, lifestyle is directly related to obesity. Um, and of course, because we think people choose their lifestyle, they can do this or they can do that, they can you know, watch a lot of TV and play on their computer, or they can uh, be active and go walk in the, in the park and do bicycle and so on. And so we have this idea that people choose their lifestyle and therefore they do choose whether they are um, fat or, or not. Um, so the, the model that we have, this sort of lifestyle model of obesity, that obesity is really directed or is really associated to your lifestyle, uh, this model is particularly popular in North America. It's deeply ingrained in the notion of choice. Um, and of course, one of the most compelling criticisms of the lifestyle uh, model is the fact that there is no consideration of how uh, political, socioeconomic, uh, historical uh, conditions substantially determine somebody's uh, lifestyle choices. And so the postcard here tends to desocialize obesity and solutions to decrease obesity seem to fall much closer to uh, you know, normally we would think that the, the solutions to obesity would be much closer to ameliorating uh, the conditions that promote unhealthy lifestyles, but uh, that's not necessarily the case today. So the example I have is uh, I, I wrote uh, Women Standing. Uh, this is the title of a research, uh, it's not a very good title, but <laughs> it sort of tells you what the project was all about. Uh, in Quebec, uh, and it might be also the case uh, here in Catalonia, but uh, in Quebec, uh, currently 58% of women work standing. Men also work standing, uh, but men usually work in jobs where they can move around, uh, whereas women tend to have static work, so they may move a meter to the left or behind, 
you know, tornat, marchat a little bit, <laughs> one meter, one meter. But uh, that's about that for women. And so a large majority, uh, not large, but a majority of women uh, work standing. And uh, when we think about lifestyle, so in this study I was involved with other women and uh, the, some of them were um, specialists in uh, er ergonomics uh, and were interested in the Ill different illnesses and disease, not diseases, but, uh, come on, Z uh, yeah, different, thank you, <laughs> my automatic translator, uh, <laughs> different ailments. Uh, that they had um, and how they did not feel comfortable in their body. They had all sorts of aches and pains. And uh, so they were having a chart where they would say, you know, uh, do you have pain in your leg? Yes. Okay. Do you have pain in your foot? Yes. Okay. And they would, you know, check everything. And it was kind of a questionnaire that way. And, um, and then we asked them all sorts of questions. And I was responsible for analyzing the uh, qualitative part of the, the study. And it was very fascinating because um, the women working standing, uh, all of them had multiple uh, aches and pains and ailments. None of them would do anything about them because they feared that if they told their employer that the working conditions were bad, uh, that they should be given a seat or that they should be allowed to do this or take a break or so on, that the employer would kick them out uh, and would, would uh, uh, kick them out of the job. Uh, so these were jobs, as you can imagine, with very little security. Um, and so they did not do anything about these uh, pains and aches, but they loved to talk about them and to, to list them. And, uh, you know, I would ask them, so what happens at night? Um, you know, wh when you are done with work, what do you do? And so they'd say, well, uh, of course, I've been standing all day. I'm totally spent. Uh, my back hurts. My legs hurt. Um, my shoulders hurt. I hurt everywhere. So I take the bus. I stand because the bus is full. It's 5 o'clock. Then I go back home and uh, I should be standing and I should be cooking a nice meal for my family, but I'm so tired. I just take something from the freezer, I put it in the oven, and then I go sit in front of the TV. Um, and I remember talking to uh, young students uh, in kinesiology uh, and physical education. And they always, you know, physical activity, you have to move, put, uh, put, put running shoes on and go running and blah, blah, blah. So when we talked to the women about that, of course, they looked at us and was like, <laughs> what, are you, what are you talking about? You know, first of all, they don't live in nice areas. Um, I don't know what I did. Uh, I don't live in a nice area, there's no parks, there's no green spaces close to where I live. Uh, it's, uh, um, you know, and it's late, I'm tired and I'm, I'm, I'm in pain everywhere. So, uh, f and, you know, and of course I don't own a pair of running shoes. And uh, you think this whole lifestyle model, you know, if we followed this model, we would tell these women that they should eat better, that she, they should move, they should be running. And of course it makes sense to some of us, uh, bourgeois white women in universities working with a computer and sitting all day and you know, wanting some fresh air and wanting to move our bodies. But for these women, it just did not make any sense. And, um, and so this lifestyle uh, model uh, of obesity just uh, is not very workable with, <clears throat> you know, the majority of women we have in our societies. Um, this brings me to the next postcard, um, which is about individual risks. So this neoliberal language of individual responsibility speaks loudly to the masses. And, uh, you know, marketeers, they tend now to focus on individual risk to personal health rather than on population risk. 
Um, and so we hear all sorts of things in the media about obesity. And mind you, it's about everything, about anything related to health. We hear all sorts of things, you know, eat more broccoli and you'll have less liver cancer and eat more green beans and you'll have, you know, more health. And I mean, we hear these kinds of stories all of the time. Uh, and of course, uh, it's an aberration simply because it's just a, you know, a mis misunderstanding or, or bad ways to look at statistics. Um, and so I'll just give you a quick uh, example here. Uh, this is a, a recent study about uh, obese women and strokes because at one point in uh, North America, they were talking about how uh, obese women were at risk for strokes. Um, and so if you look at the, uh, the numbers, you can see, for instance, that uh, th for those women who are not obese, so less than 30 of BMI, um, if we calculate uh, the number of uh, stroke cases per 100,000% uh, per 100, 000, uh, leaner women uh, for the length of the study, uh, we come up to a total of 20 strokes. And then when we look at uh, the population of obese women, and we do the same, we, uh, we look at the numbers uh, for 100,000 uh, person years, we come to 40 strokes. And so, um, you know, when you calculate the risk ratio, of course, you take 40 out of 20 and you come to a risk ratio of two. Um, this means that four stroke, about four strokes per 10,000 obese women. So it's there. There are strokes for obese women and there are strokes for uh, other people. When the media gets a hold of the story, then you'll hear things like uh, obese women are 200% more likely to have a stroke than, uh, than non-obese women. Okay, <laughs> the numbers look terrifying, like 200%. This is huge. Uh, in reality, 200% is two, right? It, so there's different ways to say the same thing. One looks more terrifying than the other. Uh, but so twice as likely. But when you look at the numbers, the lum numbers are not so terrifying. You know, 40 out of 20. So the risk ratio is two. And just to give you a, a chance to think about uh, how this works, uh, it took years, the decades indeed, for um, governments to bring the, the smoking industry, the tobacco industry, to court and to show that they uh, that cigarettes cause lung cancer. Uh, and of course, causality in statistics is impossible. You can only work with correlations. But, uh, you know, the ratio of smokers to non-smokers, and you looked at uh, cancers, lung cancer, uh, the ratio was 30 to 1. So 30 to 1, you're starting to think there's something going on there. It's a pretty high ratio. 2 to 1 is peanuts. Like, you're just like, well, this may be fluke. It might not be fluke. You're not quite sure if you were to choose another population of 100,000 women, whether you'd have these same numbers is, you know, uh, we don't know uh, because the correlation, uh, the, the risk ratio is so low. But in any case, what I'm trying to say is that in the media, people get hold of these numbers. They make them say anything they want and they present them in a way that makes for a good story. And so that's what uh, has been happening in the case of, uh, in this case for strokes and obesity. Um, another postcard is uh, this issue of the global epidemic of obesity. And what's been kind of interesting is, uh, particularly in the US for instance, they went from these maps where you had all sorts of white squares, which really mean that they didn't have statistics on in any of these, but they don't say that. <laughs> Uh, so they went from this and then they show, you know, year after year how the United States gets darker and darker and darker. And of course, if you're an American, you know, getting darker is very scary <laughs> for other reasons. Um, and so they come up with this, this idea that, uh, you know, it's going to be really bad. Some of the things that they don't say, again, postcard is, uh, this is terrible. We're going from white to black. How awful can that be? Uh, some of the things that they don't say is, yeah, we don't have statistics, now we have them. Uh, some of the other things that they don't say is that throughout the years, 
the index has changed. So for instance, in the US, uh, I think it's in 87, they changed the BMI from um, a threshold of uh, 30 for obese to 27.5. So overnight, uh, 38 million Americans became obese. Uh, simply because the index uh, changed a little bit. So so this, it looked like, oh my God, this is, you know, amplifying, it's getting bigger and bigger, when indeed the big chunk of it was simply constructed. Uh, I call this epidemic postmodern, in the sense that uh, it's not an epidemic of uh, uh, a conta contagion. Uh, it does not have any clear pathological basis. Uh, if you go into any book of medicine, you will not find fatness as a disease. This is something that the Americans invented, and then they pushed the World Health Organization to go for this idea. But if you go in universities and books of medicine, you still won't see it. <clears throat> uh, so the, the pathological basis is not there, uh, but there's a language, and especially the moral panic of traditional epidemic. And so with that, uh, you can mobilize fear, uh, and you can do certain things. You can, uh, you know, get uh, official resources to do certain things, and uh, some people have benefited from that. Um, in a certain way, what's interesting is that uh, fatness used to be in medical books uh, at about the same level of having uh, ingrown toenails or a bad back or something like this. But simply by using the rhetoric of uh, contagion and epidemic, suddenly it became, uh, you know, in the same league as breast cancer. And so it's a very interesting uh, journey, uh, on, you know, just in terms of language and how the use of certain words has catapulted uh, obesity in a totally different league. Uh, this epidemic is concerned for individual bodies, uh, which is also not normally the case for epidemics. Usually you're concerned with a population, not individual bodies, but this one is really about individual bodies. Um, it puts the blame directly on individuals, which is also a bit different. Um, it focuses on individual responsibility for ill health, and of course, uh, it does not put any attention to um, the social problems uh, that may uh, bring about certain, some of the conditions that seem to be linked to obesity, like poverty, for instance. The best uh, determinant of obesity at the moment is socioeconomic status. So, uh, um, this postcard tells us that when it comes to obesity, experts know best. Um, normally, professionals who prescribe treatment uh, must take responsibility for the clinical care that they partake. They, they must monitor efficacy, they must monitor safety. In a case of obesity, forget that. <laughs> it doesn't happen. Um, and so I talked a bit this morning about uh, Foucault and whatnot, but uh, uh, I'm not going to say a whole lot about this, but uh, at, in some other papers, I talked about um, uh, confessions of the of the of the les confessions de la chair, confessions of the flesh, um, and how um, you know how Foucault talked about um, the Christian uh, way of doing things and of constructing the subject. And, uh, and the more modern way of doing it, and it's talked about the psychiatrist, uh, which is in the middle uh, column, um, you know, as the, as the new authority who can construct the subject, can find what are the cures for the subject, and uh, what kind of, um, you know, problems they're talking about for the subjects. And he talked about that when uh, discussing issues of sexuality. Um, and so I use a bit the same uh, uh, idea of the confessions of the flesh to talk about uh, what's going on now with uh, health in most of our Western countries, 
where biostatistics, so all sorts of biostatistics, because the constructed epidemic that we have for obesity is the same. You can talk about diabetes, the same thing. They've sort of lowered all the threshold and suddenly everybody's diabetic. Uh, they've done the same for cholesterol now. So many people have cholesterol. Um, and, you know, the, the new DSM-5 that's just out and that's constructing all sorts of diseases out of, uh, you know, being shy or uh, not wanting to meet people or, uh, I don't know, anything is a disease. So <clears throat> they can find biostatistics about anything. And so the kinds of problems of the subject now are about the imperfect body that we need to you know, uh, to to perfect, um, and of course, uh, the the health professional is the new guru that's going to help us uh, to this new subjectivity. Um, we can talk about that more some of the time, but uh, in the case of obesity, simply to say that the stages for salvation then are fairly clear. First, the person need to confess, and there's no need to actually say a word. You just show, and the you know, the doctor will look at you, and if the doctor thinks you're fat enough, <laughs> then they may, or they might just take your height and weight and try your BMI and decide if you're, you know, over or below 30 of BMI, and so therefore, whether you're obese or not, and so you're confessing, your body is confessing. Then you need to convert to the truth uh, that, uh, of course, you're too fat and you need to change your life and change your ways. Um, and then as a, you know, as a punishment or as a, comment on dit en français, en anglais, um, but non, mais tu sais, quand tu vas à la confesse, tu te fais donner une, uh, une, uh, see, that's what happens when you use colonial language. <laughs> uh, penance, yes. Yeah, y penance. Uh, so, I don't know if the the translator found a word for that. If she's Christian or Catholic, maybe she's found a way to... <laughs> uh, and so you need, you know, your new life. And so this new life has nothing to do with you. I mean, we just basically look at your body and decide what the new life should be for you. We don't care what are your conditions. We don't care what, what are your means. Uh, it's just like you need to eat better and you need to exercise. And uh, so that's what we um, tell uh, people. And so, um, in the case of obesity, the main uh, prescription here uh, is weight loss uh, in all of the clinical guidelines. This is what we tell people. Uh, but we don't have any safety or effectiveness data. Uh, so that's not so, so interesting. Uh, what we do know is that weight loss regimes uh, don't work for about 95% of people. But uh, So in a way, it's, a, it's weird that we would still stick to that treatment when we know it doesn't work for 95% of people. So if you were going to the doctor and they would say, well, we'll give you that pill, but 95% of the chances it's not going to work, you would probably don't think the doctor is... <laughs> <laughs> has found a very good treatment for you. But in the case of obesity, we do that. And we have a tendency to downplay uh, the treatment risks. Uh, and the f in the case of pills uh, in the US, uh, in the USA, they've for years uh, prescribed um, diet pills, which were later found to be related to um, illness and uh, death. And they were, you know, later on uh, taken away from the market. But uh, uh, let's say that these these studies are are usually lacking. Uh, and so to come back to this idea of weight loss is the right prescription uh, and it will improve health. Um, what's very popular in Canada and maybe uh, in other places in the world is uh, um, Weight Watchers. And so, uh, of course, they, this is from their website, and so you always see p pictures of people who've lost weight, and then uh, you know, they have to write that the results are not typical because, of course, it doesn't work for most people, but uh, uh, they still put it there. And um, you know, this is uh, what's uh, advertised. Uh, but we haven't found so far. I mean, it's been 100 years now of research on obesity, and uh, 
researchers, physiologists, doctors, all of them have uh, capitulated to a certain extent in the sense that they have not found uh, the miracle pill uh, that will produce significant long-term weight loss. Um, what's interesting, though, is that despite this lack of success, um, many people have been uh, asked to uh, try to lose weight. Um, and uh, for those people who have not lost the weight, but who have been more active or have eaten better, um, we have seen a reduction in mortality rate. Um, and so one has to wonder, is it really a question of weight or is it something else like physical activity or eating well. We know that uh, weight cycling uh, is not good for you. Uh, that, you know, the, what they say, I don't know if you have an equivalent in Catalan, but in Canada we talk about yo-yo diets where, you know, you, you lose weight and then you put it back on and then you t go on a diet and you put it back on. And so, so this yo-yo dieting is uh, not good. Um, but... Uh, and so far, most uh, loss, weight loss strategies have serious side effects. In North America, of course, where all the, the worst thing happened, <laughs> I realize, um, we have now bariatric surgery. And so I don't know um, if you know anything about it, but uh, bariatric surgery is uh, where they will uh, operate on you and uh, they will shrink uh, your stomach. And of course, when they do this, there's you know some parts that have been that have to be stapled or sometimes taken away, other parts that have to be connected. And usually, uh, when you do this, you have to do this in conjunction with taking certain pills that will replace certain organs that are not secreting the necessary uh, molecules and so forth. So, uh, bariatric surgery is really bad now. In the U.S., the bariatric surgery is a private enterprise and so they're trying to have more and more people and so now they're even starting to have bariatric surgery for kids uh, which is uh, absolutely uh, uh, atrocious. Uh, the bariatric surgery is a risky operation. People are on a lifetime of drugs and it has serious side effects um, and so far the impact on health is zilch. Uh, we don't see it. So uh, that's something that uh, uh, some of some of my students. Well, one of uh, my students currently is doing her doctoral thesis on this issue of bariatric surgery for kids, um, and it's uh, it's a bit scary. Um, another, how am I doing for time? It's been a while. Maybe I'll try to be a bit quicker. Um, Another postcard is that uh, the issue of uh, women, uh, because the obesity uh, epidemic is a very gendered epidemic, and the people that have been most targeted by uh, health professionals have been women, uh, health professionals, but also all of the diet and weight loss industry and the bariatric surgery industry and so forth. Um, and so targeting women and particularly targeting pregnant women because now in North America they're talking a whole lot about uh, women breeding fat babies. Um, and so we seem to see um, a colonization of pregnant women's uh, bodies. Um, we have seen uh, this issue of uh, women of color uh, being described as mothers passing bad habits, uh, bad eating habits to their kids. Uh, we have looked at other uh, cultures, um, particularly for racialized and marginalized women in North America, as being unhealthy uh, cultures. Um, and so these processes, these very discursive processes, have been such that we've had a very um, uh, discriminating uh, and essentializing way of looking at uh, different uh, women from different cultures and the way they raise kids. And of course, in if you do the media analysis, um, you'll see white women as the, you know, the 
the the good bearers of of quality food and uh, being you know having an active lifestyle, and you see uh, you know the car culture and the uh, the bad uh, eating habits and physical activity habits of uh, women of color. So this sort of contra juxtaposition of these two groups has been quite uh, shocking. So um, in short, if I line up all of the postcards, um, these are as many discourses surrounding uh, obesity, uh, particularly in the Western world. And um, I've, um, I talk about it in some of my articles as um, contributing to the birth of this obesity clinic. And I put obesity clinic in um, quotation marks. Um, this is a, a, a clinic that's, uh, that has many sort of pseudo doctors. Um, and so all these individuals, bariatric uh, or weight loss surgeons, weight loss practitioners, obesity scientists, public health educationists, drug and insurance companies, they're all um, working in this uh, clinic. It's a clinic that's not an ordinary clinic. It's a clinic without borders. Uh, and that seemed to legitimize um, the fact that many authoritative voices are being heard about obesity, and it seems like everybody can be an expert of obesity. And so uh, in Canada, for instance, we've seen an explosion of television shows, uh, medical dramas, uh, journal newspapers, um, uh, newspaper articles, uh, on the issue of obesity and having one person or another, you know, being supposedly an expert and being able to say something about um, obesity. And of course, all these individuals give themselves the right to prescribe treatment. You know, go eat better, do physical activity. Um, seems so simple. <laughs> This obesity clinic, uh, which has no borders and which involves uh, all sorts of people giving themselves the right to say things to other people, uh, is a way to discipline the masses, um, is a way to develop what I called, or what others have called, uh, bio-citizenship. Um, individuals are placed under constant surveillance. Uh, they have to monitor themselves. Uh, and of course, the picture is such that thin people are seen in a very positive way, and uh, larger people are seen in a in a way where we say they don't have any control, they're um, lazy, uh, and we attribute our so all sorts of very bad qualities to uh, these individuals. For women, uh, particularly, what it does is, is one way to regulate women's bodies, one way to regulate women's uh, subjectivity, uh, and one way to produce a kind of very neoliberal femininity. And I, I purposely show pictures of that we see in North America of these virtuous, you know, lean women who do physical activity uh, and, of course, who have enough money to to play golf or to own a horse. Um, and through these processes, through these discourses, what we do is we pathologize the working class women who of course don't have access to these kinds of uh, leisure activities. Um, and uh, we uh, basically classify all these unruly uh, femininities, and so these femininities that are working class, fat, uh, racialized, uh, older, or disabled, um, we mark them as the other or the abject. Was there such a word in Catalan for abject? Objecta. Yes. I love this. Um, and so we have these very classed uh, processes of abjection. Uh, and of course, these processes, what they do in the end is that through this issue of obesity that's also interconnected to race, to ability, to class, and so on, um, we elicit disgust of working class women 
uh, discuss of these sort of ungovernable women who are too big, uh, who don't eat well enough, who don't participate in physical activity enough, who are too lazy, and so on. Um, we incite manic desires to improve the self. Um, and basically what happens is that we bind the self uh, to the project of its own identity, to the project of, of improving itself continuously. It's never perfect enough. And so the, it, we engage the self in this lifelong monitoring and management. Oops. Um. And so the idea is, it's not coming out very uh, nicely, but uh, where we, we try through all these means to bring the abject individuals uh, to be good bio-citizens, to be good neoliberal subjects who will uh, you know, participate in uh, culture in the way that we want, uh, that will not be unruly and so forth. And of course, to do this, we need the help of experts, i.e., um, you know, white, uh, bourgeois people who have the right knowledges um, to transform th the abject to uh, the good bio-citizen. And probably this sort of analogy is the same uh, in terms of not just obesity, but the issue of beauty, uh, the issue of health more generally, and this sort of obsession for health that we have in North America. And of course, this brings us to this idea of uh, uh, the certain limits that we have for neoliberal subjectivity. Uh, limits in the sense that uh, uh, at one, you know, where do we stop wanting to improve uh, the body as a way to improve the self, uh, as a way to supposedly being the real you that you should be? And this real you, is it ever there? Is it ever existing? Or are people put then in a, what I call a liminal space and sort of an in-between space of the bad you that you don't want to be and the good you that you really uh, deserve to be. Uh, and all your life you're <laughs> sort of in this transition that will of course never happen, but you know, that people make lots of money having you think that you will uh, attain this, uh, you know, you will go from one to the other. You will leave the liminal space to gain uh, the correct subject hood. Um, so uh, to conclude, I would say that uh, if we think about obesity, as ill health or as a disease, and we mix it with this prescription for weight loss, what it does um, is oversimplifies and desocializes a complex issue. Of course, so far we haven't found that it improves health. Uh, it blames certain individuals, particularly racialized women, uh, classed women, and so forth. It has adverse consequences for mental health because it pushes women to be constantly in this liminal space, to be not their real themselves, not their real self, um, and to always feel that uh, they're not good enough, they're not at the right place. Um, and so bad body image, bad self-confidence, uh, bad self-image, and so forth. It may lead to eating disorders, uh, it detracts from preventative care, and it distracts us from broader social issues. Um, and what I am advocating uh, instead is a healthy skepticism uh, for all of the research that's currently being done on obesity, uh, for this uh, social construction of obesity as a disease, um, this construction of obesity epidemic, um, this idea of the lifestyle model of obesity or lifestyle model of disease altogether. Uh, all of these solutions that are individualized, usually pharmacologized, uh, 
privatized. Uh, you know that when uh, these are the solutions to a problem that's so social in nature that there's something funny going on, there's something wrong going on. Um, and of course, more than ever, this healthy skepticism towards um, dominant discourses on obesity, uh, dominant discourses on the body, dominant discourses on health. Um, and uh, this sort of uh, media literacy, I guess, and uh, more research to fend off uh, this new colonization of women's bodies um, and women's lives. And um, I'll, I'll stop here uh, with my thanks uh, to all of you. And, and maybe we could, uh, if you have questions, and we could start a, a discussion around some of these issues. OK. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry for being so long. No, <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Dr. Rail, for this brilliant conference. I think we have been uh, thinking and following you over this journey. Are there any questions, something you would like to say? Hi ha cap pregunta en català, anglès, en la llengua que vulgueu? Algú, cap comentari? <laughs> I knew you were going to be the first one. <laughs> well, my question is very simple. It's like, uh, you've been criticizing the dominant discourses, but then what will be your discourse? <laughs> I'm not sure that I understood this question. See, which is the counter discourse you propose? In what consists exactly the counter discourse you propose? Yes, uh, well, uh, I guess when it comes to health in general, um, we know, for instance, um, and this has reached the level of the, the World Health Organization, um, we know that the most important determinants of health are socioeconomic in nature. And so, uh, and the same is true for the issue of obesity. Um, and so my counter discourse would be, let's forget about weight. Uh, let's focus on issue, real issues of health. Uh, and if indeed they're very much related to issue of socioeconomic status, let's uh, work at that level uh, and let's have solutions that will improve uh, the minimal uh, socioeconomic conditions uh, for, for women's lives. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, my solutions to obesity is to not talk about obesity other than to, um, you know, make people aware that this is a false direction if we want to improve the health of a population that is not where we should invest our dollars or euros. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other question or comment? Do you have a follow-up? No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, please. Oh, ah, perdona. Oh, antes. Yes, um, I would like to ask um, all the industry uh, involved with uh, thickness. I mean, all uh, all the product that here in uh, in Catalonia, in Spain, we have every summer now. There are many, many products related to getting uh, losing weight for the bikini and that that sort of thing. Uh, all this industry is uh, well depends on fatness, obviously, and there is this special pressure on women's bodies that they are never perfect. That, mm -hmm. that, that you have you have mentioned. Uh, is it related to the fact that, for instance, um, Coca-Cola or all these sugar drinks are considered food? I mean, they are considered nutritional in, mm -hmm. in, 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 in a way. I mean, um, then if the emphasis uh, would be in eating well, for instance, mm -hmm. and making things clear about what is nutrition and what's not, maybe it will be easy. 
What do you think about that? Yes. My impression well, of that. obviously, yeah. because my, my, my training is in uh, the area of kinesiology, um, you know, the same way that I, I say don't <laughs> even discuss this issue of obesity, and at the same time, uh, we cannot be against virtue, and I will always tell people that, uh, yes, physical activity and eating well, you know, is, is great. <clears throat> Um, the problem that I see is that every time we think about individual solutions to a global problem, uh, or to a social problem, uh, we go in the wrong direction. Uh, I think uh, that, yeah, Coca-Cola is really bad. I mean, it, it's, uh, the levels of sugar are just crazy. And so, um, you know, that should be discussed in, in school, uh, that should be discussed, uh, you know, in society in general, and uh, I'm, I'm all for denouncing Coca-Cola. At mm -hmm. the same time, um, you know, telling uh, certain people, uh, don't eat this, or don't do that, or don't uh, drink that, these sort of individual solutions we know do not work. And I think uh, because my first training is as a sociologist, and so I have a little bit of a bias <laughs> that way. But I think, uh, you know, social problems requires, you know, solutions that are much bigger than uh, telling people what to do. And mm -hmm. I think understanding why people do certain things, um, it's, for instance, it's not necessarily as much the case in Canada, but in some uh, in, in many parts of the United States where the problem of obesity is probably the, you know, the more, most imp important, um, <clears throat> certain subpopulations are in th these sort of, um, these areas where there's no fresh food around. There's none. Uh, they live in poor neighborhoods. There's no groceries stores. There's no supermarket. Um, if you're poor, you don't have a car to go to the suburb, uh, to the nice uh, store, uh, and the nice supermarket to, to get fresh vegetables or fresh fruit. Um, and you're in this no man's land where there's, you know, there might be a, a little, um, a tiny little grocery store that sells uh, chips and Coke and chocolate bars and, uh, you know, certain items like this. And, uh, you know, this is where people will go. And I think understanding the life conditions that will make people uh, eat certain kinds of foods versus others uh, is a much more fruitful avenue for intervention uh, than simply coming with national uh, advertising saying, don't drink Coke because it's bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, that we know. That does not work. Mm -hmm. So for me, uh, I want to say that to kids that I know, uh, but that, you know, the kids that I know might not be of a particular class or culture um, where that doesn't make any sense. You know, in, in, I mean, just to give you another example, I don't have to go very far when I'm at home, but in Montreal, <coughs> Uh, there's an area of Montreal that's quite uh, poor. Uh, researchers have looked at um, why kids do poorly at school in these neighborhoods. And what they found was really interesting is they went into the apartments because they were not houses, they were apartments because people are poor. And they found that 70% of the apartments did not have a table, like a regular table where you have meals, family meals. There's no table. They, they have the kitchen with the microwave, and then they have a couch, and then they have the TV set, and then they have a room or two with the beds. That's it. And so kids cannot work on their beds. There's no table. And so they found that the only place for them to do their homework was in front of the TV. Uh, not the best. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
but it was explaining quite a bit about their school work and why they, you know, if they don't do homework or don't have a proper place to do homework, why that's not so, that explain uh, in part their, their uh, bad grades at school. But in terms of food, can you imagine being in a place where there's no table? So if you're only eating sitting on the couch, you're not using a knife and a, and a fork, you know, and a plate on your knees. So these kids have never eaten, uh, you know, cooked vegetables. They, they've eaten things that can be eaten with their hands on their knees when they're watching TV. <laughs> Um, and same thing, having a, a glass, uh, you know, that doesn't go so well if you're on a couch, but, uh, you know, if you can put this between your legs and your bottle of Coke, that's much better. And so, the, you know, so you look at the conditions and you find certain things and you, and you think, okay, well, what should we do to change these conditions altogether? Um, and, and, you know, telling these kids, don't eat your hamburger or don't drink Coke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I know that sense. in your research, you have challenged these dominant discourses of, of obesity among other, uh, po uh, among concrete communities like Caribbean or uh, Asiatic bl or blind women. Um, what if you want just to develop a bit on it, how different communities in Canada also are affected by dominant, by dominant these discourses? Yes. Well, if, if to tell these people how to, how to not be fat uh, does not work, um, these, uh, you know, the various groups that we interviewed in our research they still uh, are quite affected by um, the dominant discourses that circulate in, in Canada. So we interviewed um, uh, youth uh, between the ages of 13 to 17, and then we interviewed young women between the ages of uh, 24 and 35. Because um, we had two or three studies uh, yeah, mostly. Uh, and then we, we, we interviewed different kinds of individuals. Um, and yes, there were many differences. Um, and obviously when you talk about uh, obesity, for instance, the, um, the Korean Canadian kids that we interviewed uh, viewed the, the, the question quite differently than kids coming from um, uh, the Middle East, for instance. And so young women from the Middle East um, were very happy to, uh, to have Canadian food and uh, to be away from, uh, for instance, a Lebanese, uh, we had Lebanese uh, young women from a Lebanese culture that encourages them, the traditional culture encourages them to eat a lot and to, um, uh, you know, to, to, to organize large uh, meals for the whole family. And uh, they were happy that in Canada they could just be on their own and eat their salad and uh, stay thin. And uh, um, so anyways, it, it was interesting to, this, to juxtapose this with um, the Korean kids who thought, well, Korean food is good for my health, but it's boring. Uh, <laughs> and I want to be Canadian, and so I want to eat pizza and hamburgers. And uh, yeah, they, they saw the goodness in certain foods, um, Korean foods, and they saw the goodness in uh, doing physical activity, for instance. But they told us how um, well, eating the right food was boring, and they'd rather eat, uh, you know, fast food, McDonald's, and so on. That's much more fun. And, uh, you know, going for walks or jogging or these kinds of activities are really boring. And what's exciting is uh, Game Boy mm -hmm. and uh, the Internet and uh, games. And so, um, in a way, uh, well, it was fascinating to 
to see some of the, the differences. And, uh, and again, a very gendered experience. Uh, young women wanting to be thin like the women in Korea. Young boys wanting to be big and, you know, muscular like the men in Canada. Uh, and so very interesting uh, gender differences. And um, so in, in that series of studies, our goal was to um, get to the, the experience of people from many different uh, parts of Canada uh, and coming from different ethnic communities. Because one of the things that we found is that uh, the government is making health messages. Uh, and these health messages are targeted at white bourgeois Canadians. And usually these are not the people who most need uh, the help of the government when it comes to uh, food and physical activity. Uh, they're see and at the same time, the messages, because they're targeted for a very white, bourgeois, able-bodied uh, audience, the other groups, when they listen to the media, it, you know, they don't, it goes over their head, like they're not interested, it's not for them. They don't see themselves in these messages, they don't listen, it's not interesting for them. And we were uh, concerned about spending public money uh, to do something that does not work. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it, it just seems crazy. And so that's why in all of the research, we try to not just go with the dominant group, but try to look at many different groups, understand why there are differences, uh, maybe suggest certain strategies with different groups. Uh, and every group is, uh, is a bit different. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's a complex reality that requires a complex um, solution. So there's no miracle pill, uh, no easy answer. Um, and for me, in the, in the sense of obesity, I, my main message is let's forget about obesity. Let's not talk about that. Let's talk about important things, um, the social factors that determine health. <laughs>